So, Remonster, should you watch it? The guy is a dryad for five hours and then proceeds to have a with five women and a hobgoblin. What do you think? But no, in all seriousness, in a flood of isekais, Remonster manages to stand out from the crowd, coming from the perspective of somebody becoming a monster. Kind of like Walmart brand reincarnated as a slime, featuring a main protagonist that has become a goblin, thankfully not visited by the Goblin Slayer, and building an empire of goblins, variants of evolutions, and a human harem. Touching on both the power fantasy elements of a charged main character, while also tinkering with the elements of sub-races and their strive for survival. There's just one teensy problem. Studio Dean. But anyhow, this is my thoughts on the first three episodes of the series airing in the spring 2024 anime season, so let's just jump right into it. Remonster opens up with our protagonist who doesn't even feel it's worthy even mentioning his name because, yes, he's being stabbed to death by some crazy chick with an electric knife. I'm sure that's going to be very important later because it was just too specific. But yes, it's not over for our main character because he quickly wakes up as a child. But not just any type of child, a goblin child. <laughs> And very quickly, as goblins do in this world, he quickly grows up, and then eventually he's told to go out and strive for himself, to survive on his own. As the elder pretty much was feeding him for a while, he's like, yeah, after five days, you're on your own. Which doesn't really affect him too much because he still has his memories from his previous life, so he used that to his advantage in order to find and hunt down monsters. Well, yes, bring along his friend, Gobukichi. Now, Gobukichi is like more of a brute type, so he's using him to sort of scare the monsters to a location so that he can jump on them and trap them. And yes, as he needs to consume in order to survive, he starts eating all the monsters that they're actually killing, and not only that, but he's gaining skills at the same time. Yes, there's a little bit of an additional information here. In his previous life, some people actually had abilities, and specifically for our main character, he had the ability of absorption which allowed him, when he's consuming the flesh of whatever he defeats, he's able to sometimes gain skills. So yes, as he's hunting and surviving with Kopukichi, yes, he's gaining different skills. And yeah, at the same time, he's leveling up really quickly. So fast that within a few days, he's already up to like 86. And when they reach 100, they're able to actually evolve. And yes, he does. He becomes a hobgoblin. What sort of happens after this is yes, he continues to hunt. Over time, he starts to get the interest of the other goblins. They all start to kind of form around him. He's actually feeding a lot of them even despite the fact that in his previous life he was pretty much all about himself, numero uno. Now he's sort of having a desire to help the other goblins and they're getting stronger and they're rising up and he's teaching them how to hunt and survive and get stronger themselves. All until eventually the previous generation of goblins return back home, the raiders. This is the previous generation that have mostly all become hobgoblins at this point. And very quickly, yes, he established himself as pretty much the alpha. And this is all because the raiders brought home some human women in order to continue to procreate, and he didn't want them to touch them. So as he's keeping them safe, he's training the others. They're kind of setting themselves aside, getting up to equipment and whatnot. Even additionally, yes, even the human females start to take a liking to him. All the way to the point where, yes, he even evolves once again to an ogre. And like I mentioned earlier, yes, after a run-in with a dryad... <laughs> And the dryad leaving behind some marks, some hickeys on his necks, he ends up having a whole harem of um, enjoyment. So my thoughts on Remonster so far. I actually find this to be a very, very refreshing and very new type of anime to kind of jump into. Yes, it kind of is in the vein of something like Reincarnated as a Slime, where the main character becomes a monster, and thus they're building up stats and skills and all that kind of stuff, and eventually building up the, a, a kingdom of some sort. A lot of people look to them for leadership, and yes, there's the presence of humans in the world, different monsters and all that kind of stuff. It is sort of in that vein, but this one feels a lot more condensed. It's a lot more easy to kind of consume. It's not as much in the politics that Slime kind of gets into. Slime very quickly kind of builds in the other nations and whatnot. But this one kind of keeps stuck to this kind of cave right here and hasn't really branched out quite yet. It's sort of more focusing in on the oddity of being a goblin and yes, their strive for survival. What they have to do to survive, how their tribe kind of builds up. It's very much so about the the strong lead, that kind of stuff. And yes, the added bonus of his skill absorption and how that kind of allows him to sort of set himself aside from everybody else. And that's something that I really find fascinating. It's something that kind of sets itself aside from everything else. I do like that aspect of the tribe leader and, and building up this tribe in order to survive and what sort of difficulties they may run into. It kind of got in this little oddity about, yes, earlier he was talking about how he brought home food to the other goblins because they tried to kill him the night before. <laughs> 
They've been basically hunting so much and feeding themselves that the other goblins who haven't learned to survive for themselves are now attacking him in the middle of the night. And he decides that he's going to bring home a bunch of food in order to feed them. And additionally, he also decides to lead them. He actually gained this new ability called Order, which allows him to sort of kind of lead things. And this is something that he really didn't see himself doing because in his previous life, it was all about himself. It seems to imply this idea that he was fighting a lot in his previous life. He was either a combatant or an assassin of some sort. But that mindset doesn't extend to whenever the previous generation brings back the human females. He just immediately says, yes, I know this is basic instincts, but I still can't stand by. I don't want them to touch these women. So he kind of has them set to the side, takes over the leadership of the actual tribe and says, do not touch them. And when somebody actually goes to try to touch them, he sets an example, <laughs> strings them up and beats them. Yes, pretty much to death. Again, I like the fact that it's so tribal and it's not necessarily trying to make it human. This is just how they live. They even dabble a little bit into his actual mothers, which were a bunch of human females that were locked up in the storage room that eventually took their own lives. And I do like the fact that it exists even though it doesn't dwell on it too much, but there's a side of me that kind of thinks, wow, that could have been kind of cool to actually have him interact with, yes, his actual mothers. Which is sort of an area where I start to get into my question mark with this series so far. Being based on a light novel, I wonder just how much he actually got into his mindset around his actual mother. Because in the anime, it kind of just feels like a side note. Like, oh yeah, one day they took their lives and so they burned them and then they moved on. It could very well be that he wasn't very attached because he was more focused on self-survival. And that feeling of things sort of missing from the adaptation extends to episode three, where suddenly out of nowhere, it just feels like the story is going in breakneck speed. Like, like the structure of the show itself is based on days. And so every time another day kind of cuts over, you'll get a black screen with the day and then what I did that day. And then black screen, day, what I did that day. And at some point it just feels like it's just trying to get as through as many days as possible. <laughs> And that could be that they're trying to skip forward in the days in order to get to the juicy stuff, but still, it there is a point which I'm starting to wonder how much of this light novel is just not being adapted. Still, with structure aside, I really do like the premise here. Again, the idea of somebody starting a new life as a goblin, a monster of the world itself, and him rising up. Again, I really do like the emphasis on the tribe itself. Early on, it doesn't feel like he wants to get involved with them, but very quickly he pulls in Gobukchi, and he's pretty much like his his muscle man. It does kind of give a sense later on that Gobukchi sees how much Goboro, the main character being Goboro, he sees how Goboro has kind of built up and evolved, and it seems like at some point he decides to go out on his own because I think he's trying to get strong too. Yeah, you have the presence of the other goblin girls who start to take interest in him because he is a strong leader, he is an alpha of the group, so they're kind of following him around and trying to be a part of him as well. And like I said, yes, everybody else sort of seeing that he is achieving things and wanting to follow him. It's like a, a natural instinct to follow the one that is the strongest that is actually successful. My only fear so far for the story itself is how much emphasis they put on the previous world. It has me a little bit afraid this might have a lot of crossover for his previous life. And yes, as I've mentioned previously before, in most cases where I see this sort of blending of the two worlds, it never works out right. It's typically in the idea that at some point they run into another isekai, and that stuff always kind of ends up ruining the story or ruining the feel of the show. And again, like I said, because there was so much emphasis on the lady that actually stabbed Goboro to death and the weapon that she was using and the fact that he has ability from his previous life, it makes me really uh, pretty sure that they're going to probably bring her back into the picture and... Like I said, typically when they do that, it's really cheesy, but we'll see. We'll leave it to if it actually happens. For now, it's all kind of working out really well. All right, with all that aside, let's get into the big negative. The big negative that, yeah, I'm sure plenty of people in the comments will say it's not that bad. But yes, this is the third offering. There's three total offerings from Studio Dean this season. And yes, most know that Studio Dean's is not the most high quality, high production studio out there. They have some masterpieces out there. Yeah, Showa Gengroku, Rakuku Shinju, that's, a, that's one right there. But they're not high quality. And when they have three total shows in one season, I have a lot of fears for the quality of the show itself. And yes, we've already seen with Banished Former Hero, that show doesn't look great. I haven't watched Tadaima Okaidi. I'm sure that's probably not looking too great. And unfortunately, yes, Remonster is another example of a show that's very quickly showing production issues. Now, the first episode looked really good. It was a pretty solid, I don't know, probably like a 6 out of 10. I mean, visual quality anyways. 
It had good perspective shots. It had some pretty cool little angles. It was doing a good job. And yes, putting a lot of effort into how much animation was in them eating flesh. But as we got into the second episode, the eating animations were still good, but then you started to see the quality actually drop for everything else. The actual action, the movement itself, there was a lot of panning shots. It just suddenly out of nowhere, it started to show some rough edges. And yes, things got worse with episode three. Besides the whole dryad scene, which I'm, I would admit they put the effort where it was needed. The whole dryad <laughs> banging scene was, was quite well animated. But everything else was just mostly just stills and panning and zooming in and zooming out and mouth flaps. It wasn't really much quality put in there. At some point, it just became a slideshow, especially towards the later part where it's just jumping days and it's just, oh, this day. And then suddenly there's a, a boar coming towards him and it's a steal and it's just zooming in. It just, out of nowhere, the quality just, it's not there. Visual quality has pretty much stopped. And that's what has me extremely fearful for the show, despite the fact that it's kind of refreshing and it's set up in what it's kind of providing. The fear that if we're already having this kind of quality in episode three, what's the next nine episodes gonna look like? And again, them's the breaks for Dean. But I don't know, maybe I'm just being too picky, but we'll see where it goes from here. Anyhow, that's my thoughts on Remonster so far. Hope you guys enjoyed this video as always. If you did, make sure that like button down below, comment. Let me know what you think of the series, if you're gonna be checking it out, or yes, tell me how much episode three looked just perfectly fine. <laughs> and Andrew's too picky. Additionally, if you're new to the channel, make sure that subscribe button to get my content. I do news reviews, first impressions, top list if it's anime, it's pretty much here. Additionally, if you like this content and you want to support the channel more, I have a Patreon link, tips, links, super links, membership button down below. Greatly appreciate it, but it does. And y'all take care.